I, I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson and end up with where we are now. Uh, and uh, it, it starts really with when I first started treating patients with melanoma. It was about 20 years ago at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. And, and we were the basket case of oncology. Uh, the last oncologist appointed into any large hospital was given the melanoma practice because nothing really worked terribly well. And uh, it, it could be quite disheartening, difficult conversations with people who, uh, as uh, was highlighted in the press today, usually only survive between six and nine months from their diagnosis. Uh, but since then, we, we, we've made the front page of the papers, both in the US and uh, over here in the UK, and we, we even get billed with people like Taylor Swift, uh, which was far more impressive to my daughters, I have to say, than anything that I'm going to tell you about now. Um, so why the basket case? Well, 20 years ago, we used chemotherapy in common with all other cancers, but we had the sorts of benefits for patients that... Uh, really made it uh, pretty hard work. Fewer than one in 10 patients benefited from decarbazine, which was our staple for many years. Attempts to improve upon that got the response rates, the number of people whose tumors shrank on treatment, up a little bit. But ultimately, it never worked for very long, as shown by this, this curve here. Uh, as the curve goes down, that's an indication of the proportion of people who are no longer benefiting from treatment. And for those of you with really good eyesight, we're down to about 20% of people within a couple of months of starting. And that was very much our reality. It didn't mean we were happy with it, and the first 10 years of my life were spent trying to improve upon this and to overcome resistance to chemotherapy. And you can see here each of the orange things, this laser pointer is not working, so I apologize. Um, if you look at all the orange bits here on the, uh, on the graph, these are attempts to add in drugs to standard chemotherapy to improve uh, the outcome for our patients, none of which worked. So that slides about 10 years of my life and ultimately futile. Uh, it's not all wasted effort. PARP inhibitors you might have heard about if you have friends with ovarian cancer or breast cancer, and these are licensed drugs now in that situation where people have mutations in a gene called BRCA. Uh, so you know, no work is entirely wasted. Uh, but we've now shifted totally away from chemotherapy, hardly ever use it, uh, and move on to immunotherapy. Now, immunotherapy actually predates chemotherapy. Chemo came out of mustard gases and observations in the Second World War and really took off in the 1950s and then the 60s. Immunotherapy has been around since about the 1890s, and that, that sort of slightly stern-looking guy, the only one with hair on that picture is called Coley, he's an American surgeon, and he invented toxins, having made the observation that people with breast cancer, women with breast cancer, who had infections seemed to do rather better uh, than those who did not. Uh, and his first clinical trial, if you want to call it that, involved injecting live bacteria into cancers uh, before operating on them. Now, if you think that it's daunting going on to a clinical trial now, uh, think about that. This is 1890. There are no antibiotics. Um, so it was a brave patient to take part in that. It wasn't a controlled trial either, so it, it, things didn't really move on from there, uh, at least as far as drugs are concerned, uh, until the 1950s and 60s when we started to be aware that cytokines like interferon, that rather complicated diagram bottom right, uh, and interleukin, uh, were important in regulating how the immune system worked, and we started to use those some 20 years later when monoclonal antibodies uh, and the technology to generate large quantities of drugs became available. Uh, Cherry Boone, the, the, the chap in the tie, uh, at the Ludwig Institute in Brussels then started to describe some of the targets that were specific to cancer, called cancer testis antigens, uh, the first ones of which were discovered in melanoma. Uh, and from there, we've developed a bunch of other treatments, including interleukin-2 and cellular therapies. And that's Steve Rosenberg from the National Institutes of Health Surgical Branch, who's been the pioneer, really, of that uh, over in the U.S. So we've known for a long, long time that we can get some benefit from immunotherapy. And it's always been about 5% of patients who've ha had a benefit. And that's what Steve described in, in his series of trials. But... You know, it's only really in the last six years that we've started to see major, major improvements. So what took us so long, you know, over 100 years of effort before we actually made any, any headway? 
Well, making immunotherapy drugs is way, way more complicated than making chemotherapy. Most chemotherapies are very simple chemical structures. The targeted agents, the BRAF inhibitors and so forth that we also use, very si simple chemically. Immunotherapy is much, much more complicated. These are proteins. They're much harder to make, and the technology for that has only really appeared in the last 30 years in any scale. A lot of the ideas that we borrow from infectious diseases, it turns out that that was way, way more simple uh, than cancer. Uh, and in particular, you don't really have this phenomenon of immune tolerance where the body actually accepts that the cancer's there, doesn't recognize it as foreign, and lets it stay. And we don't really know what we're doing, and that's still true today. Uh, and until recently, we had too few people, that sort of one in 20 who were benefiting meant that we couldn't really get a foothold and describe what it was about them that made immunotherapy work and then translate that into much wider learning. But since then, we've made a lot of progress. We understand how it works, and I'm not going to go through this slide. It'll be available online afterwards. But there's a stepwise way in which the immune system recognizes the tumor sorts out the T-cell response to that, drives it back to the tumour and starts to kill the cells. And there's lots of ways in which that can break down. And it's very, very complicated. The immune system is very, very highly regulated because if it goes wrong, and there are a bunch of autoimmune conditions in life that, that, where this happens, it, it can be fatal. Uh, and that's also part of the concern about the toxicity of the approach that we use. So it's controlled for a reason, and it's understanding that control that's allowed us to start to make progress. So at the moment, melanoma is very much the proving ground for immunotherapy. Circled up there, top right, are the two drugs that have been licensed and now going to be approved for use in, in England uh, in combination. But there's a host of other approaches that are being tested, including the use of cellular therapies, which again are technically very, very demanding, but coming through and look very powerful. Uh, and then over on the left, the, some of our first approaches, which haven't really borne fruit, but are now being revived, dusted down, and looked at again in light of what we can do with these checkpoint inhibiting and stimulating antibodies that are proving so effective. Can you adv stop advancing now? Could you give me the next slide, please? Thank you. So, why is melanoma the proving ground for immunotherapy? Well, what it probably boils down to is that there are more mutations in melanoma than in any other cancer. So this is a series of cancers with the highest mutations on the right, the lowest number on the left. The, these dots really represent the number of mutations and genetic lesions seen in particular tumors. And you can see that in melanoma, because of the UV damage and so forth, there's very, very high levels of mutations. And that means probably more targets for immunotherapy. And it's no surprise that the other indications in which we're starting to see immunotherapy make headway, like lung cancer, are next. And the, the diseases that perhaps don't do so well, like breast cancer, some of the childhood cancers, are further down that way. Now, this is a pretty loose correlation, uh, but uh, it does seem to be working out and gives us one of those toeholds in describing how we're going to identify who benefits more effectively. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so... This all changed really only six years ago in 2010 when at the ASCO meeting these data were published showing uh, that ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 antibody, is better than a peptide vaccine, which is effectively a placebo, I think, mo most of us would think. Uh, and more importantly, if you look at the way that these curves flatten out as they move off over to years two, three, and four, bringing long-term benefit uh, to patients. A minority, so clearly lots more to do, but uh, that's what we're looking for, not this sort of weeks and months that we can get with chemotherapy. Next slide, please. And then last year, we saw a number of important new pieces of information. The, the second class of drugs, the, the PD-1 inhibitors, is better than ipilimumab. So this is actually the pembrolizumab, but the results are very similar for nivolumab. Uh, and we have a number of trials now that show that, that it's better to use these ahead of the ipilimumab. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, and we also had information that using viruses that we can inject directly into the tumour is also of benefit to some patients. Now, this result isn't perhaps as impressive as some of the other ones that we've seen because it's, this is an approach that really only works for people who have tumours on the surface of their skin uh, and in relatively small quantities. 
But again, it's, it's one of these little toe holes that we can use to, to climb higher up the cliff face. Uh, and in fact, using this in combination with some of the more powerful antibody drugs is now looking very, very promising. Next slide, please. Uh, and then perhaps the most significant piece of information, and the one that's driving the announcement today by NICE, is that using Nevo and Ipi together is more powerful than using either drug alone. So what you have at the bottom there in the green line is Ipi, uh, in, in the middle blue line is Nevo, and then the red line is combination. And what this shows for the first time is more than half of our patients getting benefit from treatment with significant tumour shrinkage. But as you can still see, it's a long way from 100%. 100% will be driving right the way across there. So there's still a lot of work to do. And next slide, please. What it does come at uh, is at the price of significant toxicity. Now, this is very much a jargon slide, but grade 3 and 4 toxicity, for those of you not familiar with how we count the side effects of treatment, is the sort of side effect that means we stop treatment, we have to take other measures, perhaps even bring people into hospital in order to combat them. And what we see here is that this can affect up to 20% of people. Next slide, please. And in particular, it seems to affect the bowels uh, and the liver uh, and means that there are limits on how much immunotherapy we can give. And that's one of the key themes that we're now looking to develop over time. Next slide, please. You know, can we make this treatment better? So the first thing to say is that not everybody benefits from immunotherapy. Depending upon how we give it, even with the best drugs available to us today, between 40 and 70% of people whom we treat will not respond to it. There's a group of people whose tumours are growing simply too fast to give us the time for the drugs to work. They work over weeks rather than days. So if you have a BRAF mutation, your tumour's moving very, very quickly, that's a BRAF inhibition is a better option than immunotherapy. We also know that if the melanoma starts in the eye, these drugs don't work in nearly the same way. We're looking at about 2 to 3% of people responding to these treatments. And where the melanoma spreads the brain, and that's a pretty common occurrence, it is more difficult. And if you already have autoimmune conditions, then kick-starting the immune system may not be very good for you. So there's a group of people admittedly small, in whom this simply isn't a good idea for reasons other than their melanoma. So next slide. So the question now is, well, where do we target our efforts to make this better? And probably two areas that are, we're most interested in is getting the T cells, and this is down at the very bottom, into the tumour, because we know that that's a hallmark of how you benefit from the drugs that are available to us now. Where we don't see those T cells in the tumour, we don't seem to get a response from the PD-1 inhibitors in particular. And then the other thing is, is in trying to kick-start the whole process with recognition that there's a problem. And this is the basis of all the vaccination approaches, trying to make the immune system see the tumour, recognise that there's a problem. Because fundamentally, cancer cells are all part us. So the, the immune system is hardwired to ignore us, uh, and that's a problem that needs to be got around. Next slide, please. Thanks. So there's a whole host of drugs that, that are now being touted as potential successes or, use, or, or to be used in combination with the drugs that we've got as the basis for effective treatment. And the problem now is how we work out which is best and how best to use them. And one example that we've been testing in Oxford is called IMC GP100. And because time is short, I'm going to speed through this very quickly. All of the drugs that we've got at the moment are, are antibodies, the CTLA-4, the PD-1, so they recognize a full protein sitting on the surface of the cancer cell. Now, if we can recognize chopped up protein, what's called peptides, presented by what's uh, the human leukocyte antigen, which is the driver for showing the immune system what's going on in the body, then we've got about 10 times as many targets to aim at. And that's what IMC GP100 aims to do. It targets... A, a peptide from a protein called GP100, which is specific to melanocytes. So it's not good for your skin, um, but it's even worse for melanoma cells. And what it does is it binds very, very tightly to cancer cells because of some extremely clever engineering that took the best part of a decade to get right. Uh, and then at the back end, it's got a universal receptor for T cells, which means that T cells, that the killing cells of the immune system, are attracted and bolted on to the... Um, 
the, the cancer cell. And that's shown in this electron micrograph here, bottom right. And um, when you've got a, a tight bolting on like that, what the T cell then does is inject stuff into the cancer cell to kill it. So that's the premise for that. And the reason I show you this, and I'll skip over that in the interest of time, is that this is one of the first immunotherapies that looks as though it has activity in ocular melanoma. So melanoma that starts in the eye rather than the skin. So on the top in the green, we've got what's happened to patients with reveal melanoma who've been treated with this. And on the bottom in the blue, we've got patients with skin melanoma who've been treated with this. Uh, and if you look at the left-hand side of the graph with these spider plots, what you can see is that we're getting responses in people that last for, for, for a really long time, in the longest case, three years. So that, again, is, it's another of these toe holds that, that looks really interesting because it, it accesses a different group of melanoma patients that are currently not being looked after by the treatments we have available. This, again, probably easier to look at online later, shows some T cells going into the tumour as a result of the treatment, so proving that concept of dragging them in. And for that reason, and I'll skip over that again in the interest of time, is we think that one of the ways in which it can best be developed is in combination with the checkpoint inhibitors. And there's a trial running now and, and shortly to open in the UK uh, that will look at that in some detail. Obviously, one of the concerns we have is about side effects. The other way in which I think we can make headway, and don't pay too much attention to the slide other than to absorb that there's a lot of this going on, and this is the work of dozens of people, is that we need to understand the mutations in the cancer, how they relate to the bits that are presented to the immune system on the surface of the cell, and how the immune system reacts to that. Because by understanding that circle, we can define how better to treat patients. And the way in which we do that is to study in very, very great detail using multiple teams what happens when we give immunotherapy. And this is just one example of the complexity that we face. So this is a single test pulling out all the T cells in the blood of somebody on treatment and then categorizing them according to their specific role in activating the immune system. And what you can see here is in somebody who's had treatment with pembrolizumab is that those populations change over time. And by understanding how they change and which cell populations matter, we hope that over the course of the next few years, we can use the first blood test to predict who should get what treatment. So the question now is, well, where do we go from here? And we're going to hear a little bit more about individual experiences, clinical trials, and so forth later on this morning. But the question really for us as melanoma doctors, and therefore for what we present to you as melanoma patients, is, well, how do we improve from treatment that already works? Because 20 years ago, my life as an experimental oncologist was really very easy. Nothing worked, so almost anything was worth trying. Um, and if you missed out on the rather minimal benefits of decarbazine, you weren't missing out on very much. But now we have to be a lot more careful. There's effective treatment. There's probably, for some patients, curative treatment available. Uh, so we have to be clear that the evidence for bringing a new drug forward has to be much, much greater than it was a few years ago. Also, because as we understand more, there are all sorts of plausible combinations of drugs out there. And far more than we have uh, the capability of testing, either in terms of the number of doctors available to us or in terms of the number of patients. Melanoma affects between two and 3,000 patients a year with metastatic disease. Uh, and so we have to have regard for that in deciding what sort of clinical trials to take forward. Otherwise, we end up with a whole hodgepodge of very, very small studies that tell us very little and don't benefit anybody. And I think I'll just leave it there. Uh, because there's lots more to talk about. Final slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and I think the thing to emphasize from a, a research point of view and also from a treatment point of view is the way we make progress is by getting lots and lots and lots of people together. When I started out, we thought that a big trial in melanoma was a couple of hundred patients. Now we think in terms of five, six hundred, up to one to two thousand in some settings. And it's really by, look, by organizing ourselves and working effectively together, not just doctor to doctor, but doctor to patient, that we've really started to make headway. And that's something we've learned from the commoner cancers like breast cancer and colon cancer. So thanks very much.